What's going on guys? Welcome back to Pure Evil on the May. I have a very special guest with us here today. Joining me once again, we have Diego Lima. What's going on, Diego? How are you doing? What's up, boss? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me again. You know, everything's good, man. So, obviously, last time we talked, it was literally right before you are on the, the Season Ultimate Fighter, Season 25. A lot has happened. So, we have a lot to catch up on. And I really want to catch up. Kind of from most recent, um, you know, you just had this fight with uh, Yusuke Okami. Your brother just had that fight with uh, Rory McDonald. I mean, there's been a lot of exciting things going on right now in the in the Lima household, huh? Oh yeah, for sure, man. We've been busy. You know, it was a great year last year, and you know, we wanted to start start with a few extra ones extra fights this year, but you know, it's been happening. It's been going great. You know, it's been fun. It's been a good year. It's been a good year. You know, we've both been healthy now, and we've just been training. It's been great. So what was that fight like with Yushin Okami, man? I mean, the guy's a freaking legend in MMA. Was it kind of intimidating fighting uh, fighting him? But at the same time, I mean, you're no stranger, you know. Not at all, you know. My, you know I've, been, I've been in the sport for a little bit now, you know. And, man, my brother has fought for a title before. So I've been around, you know, big fights my whole career, and, you know. It was just, and on that one, man, it was just bad luck, man. Bad luck, you know. I tore my cartilage on my rib 30 seconds into the fight, so I just, that, that was, it was bad luck, man. It sucked. Well, also speaking of bad luck, I mean, you know, you, you well, actually, good luck. You made it to the tough finale once again, but unfortunately, Jesse Taylor popped, and I've been wanting to know your input on this. Of course, this was after the fight that you guys had, but how did that make you feel when you found that information out about Jesse? Man, at first it sucked, man. At first I was hurt, man. I was like, man, that's bull, you know, because it was right after the fight. So, you know, I, I said a couple of things online, too, you know, that I shouldn't have. But, man, I was just very, very upset in the beginning, you know. And then after, you know, I, I, I just I just started thinking after. And, you know, I trained with Jesse at the house. You know, I, I know how hard he works, man. You know, he trains 24-7. Dude is always in the gym. He's always training hard. And, you know, he beat me, man, you know, that's just, that's just what it is, you know, I, I'm over that, you know, he, he took a while to get over, but, you know, I'm over that, you know, he just, he beat me, he beat me, you know, I don't really look into that anymore. So let, let's jump into that season of Ultimate Fighter because that was an awesome experience. I mean, just in case nobody remembers or hasn't watched the Ultimate Fighter that season, you know, season 25, we had Cody No Love going up against TJ Dillashaw. Now, you know, obviously those two have an upcoming fight once again for the rematch because the first time was amazing. But what was it like training alongside uh, TJ for, the, for those few weeks and Dwayne? Man, it was awesome. It really was. I learned a lot from those guys, you know. It was, man, it was one of the best experiences of my life, you know. I said that from the first season and this season was the same thing, you know. Because when, when you just train, man, you don't have anything to worry about. It's just amazing, man. You know, TJ and, and Dwayne, man, they have a great system together. And, you know, just watching them and they're, they're showing us their stuff too, you know. But they don't really show much because, you know, you're only there for six weeks, but... Man, I, it just clicked for me, you know, that style, you know, really fit my game. And, man, I learned a lot, you know, from those guys. And it was just a great experience. Well, when you were watching Cody, when you were watching Cody fight TJ, did, did you see some things that, you know, you guys were learning, just like little pieces? No, for sure, for sure, man. You know, that's that's TJ's style, you know. And he, he didn't he held anything back, man. Like, if you asked him, like, he would show you, you know, he showed every combo they're working on and, you know, there's nothing to hide, man. The thing is, he he's he got so many combinations, man. It's just too hard to figure him out. If you think you figured one thing out, he's gonna come at you with something else. You know, if you think you figured him out south, well, he's gonna come back and do orthodox. And you know, if you think he's kicking, he's gonna come at you and box. And if you think he's boxing, he's gonna wrestle you. So, you know, that's the guy, man. Even if he shows you everything he does, you know, it's just too hard to figure it out because he's got that system down, man. You know, if it, something doesn't work, he's got to jump right back into the next thing. So it, it's just great to see that. And I saw that in the fight. You know, he readjusted. He went to his kicks, and then, boom, something landed. So that was just great great to watch. You know, how, how did you think that TJ did that season coaching you guys? I mean, it's not like he's an actual coach. You know, this was kind of his first experience with it. How did he do? <laughs> oh, man, he's one of the best coaches I've seen, man. You know, he was great teaching. He, he was there all the time, man. He was holding back because we're 170s, man. Before TJ's like, he weighs, what, I think 150, 150, 153 bags. And, man, and he would hold pads for us. Like, you know, to hold pads for a bigger guy, it sucks, man. He didn't care. Like, he was, he was all in it, man. He, he was a great coach. 
so that season, you know, it started off TJ's team, you know, your guys' team was doing a, an amazing job. And then, you know, they, they, they were trying to get like a weak spot on you guys. And they thought that you versus Hader Hassan would be the turning point. Uh, you know, Hader had some comments to say. And, uh, you know, you've commented on it before, but now that you have had some time to digest, have you reached out to him like, hey, man, like, what was that all about? Or, you know, where did you leave off with him? I mean, when I was watching that season and I was watching the episode where they matched you two up, I was like, oh, no. Because the whole time I was like, I hope they don't match these two up. I hope they don't match these two's up. So what was that season like, man? What was your favorite moment on that season? You had fights with Tom Galuccio, who actually did a lot better than a lot of people expected. Did he catch you guys off guard, really, coming into it? Oh, uh, heck yeah, man. Tom's the man. But, you know, he didn't catch us off guard, man, because we, we train with him, you know? And he, man, in training, like, if he takes you back in training, man, like, you're not getting out. You know, like, it's really hard to get out, and. And the, the guys he fought, you know, it was great matchups. You know, they were very strong guys, but not really, you know, a bit known jujitsu guys. So, you know, we, he knew it, man. He was confident. And, you know, especially with Eddie, you know, Eddie's such a big guy, man. And everyone's like, man, Eddie's going to tear him apart, you know. But, you know, jujitsu is jujitsu, man. And, you know, Tom found a way to take the bag. And that's what happens, man. When that dude takes your bag, it's no joke. Yeah, that fight was, was crazy. I think that fight especially shocked a lot of people with Tom Galicio being able to get that win starting the season off like that. But what do you think was, you know, your favorite moment from uh, this season of Ultimate Fighter? Uh, man, my favorite moment was making it to the finals again, man. Just getting that hand raised and being there for six weeks, man, a lot of training, every, put everything into it. And then when my hand was raised, you know, when I – Probably Tom sucked, you know, because I liked the guy so much. But, you know, once my hand was raised at the end, that was, you know, it's like, oh, you know, here we go again. You know, I made it back, and this was very exciting. So moving forward, man, some big things have been happening in your guys' life. Obviously, this fight with Rory McDonald that your brother just had. Can you walk us through that? Can we relive that fight? Because it really seemed like your brother had it in the bag in the, in the first couple of rounds there. Uh, what, what was going through your mind in those first few rounds? Man, the first few, when he landed a few kicks, man, we were just like, oh, oh yeah, here we go. You know, it's, it, we... we pretty much knew he was going to be our night, man. And then the third round, he, he lands that other kick that drops him, mounts him. We're like, okay, here we go. I think that was in the fourth round where he dropped him with the kick. And then we saw Rory's leg, man. And, you know, I looked at my coach and we're like, holy crap, like that's bad. And, you know, we, we didn't even know he was going to come back for the fifth round, man. And, you know, that's just one tough dude, man. The fifth round, he came out softball and he just rushed him and was able to get him down, man. I don't know, man. My brother, he just he just stayed in his guard, you know. But we all kept yelling, hey, look to get up, you know, get up. Because if he scrambled, you know, he, he, he only had one leg. But, you know, it just it, it clicked off on him a little bit. He, he's still to this day, man. He's so pissed about that round. And, you know, it is what it is. You know, he learned a lot. But, you know, it just shows him what level he's at. And that fight only grew him, man. Only grew him. Because now, you know. It's going to be trouble from now on for whoever fights him. It always was, and, you know, this now is just going to get even worse. 
you know, what, what's what's going on in his mind? Uh, obviously, they're trying to match up Roy McDonald versus uh, Gegard Mousasi. I actually think they went through with that. You know, how, did you, how do you guys feel about that? Because your brother definitely wants to get that rematch, and there's really not many yeah, other that, people. That, yeah, that's bull crap, man. There, there's no reason for that right now. You know, no reason, man. You got these guys at 85, like, what for, you know? Like, you, Roy barely won that belt. He couldn't even walk out, walk out of that cage, man. You know, like, give the guy a rematch, man. You know he deserves it. He was a champ. You know, and a lot of scorecards, a lot of people was like, man, just the damage Roy took. Like, there's no way you can take somebody's belt just by that damage, you know? Like, taking somebody down and doing no damage, you know, that's not a win. Like, give the guy his rematch, man. You know, that's bull crap. I, I really don't think Roy will ever fight him again. Like, as much damage as he took, I, I really I really think Roy has nothing to do, doesn't want anything to do with my brother anymore. And I, I guarantee you that. Uh, he's just looking to move to 85. You know, we got guys like Koresh Koff right now. We got my brother. We got John Fish, Paul Daly, Lorenz. You know, all these guys are 170. And you're going to go up to 185? Like, come on, bro. You know, he's looking for a way out. He wants nothing to do with my brother anymore. And, you know, it's showing. He's going to go to 185 and then what? He's just going to pick his easiest fight, you know. He's not going to. I guarantee to you he won't fight my brother until unless Bellator is like, hey, this is the fight we're making. I don't care what you say. I guarantee to you that, man. Yeah, it seemed like Scott Coker was kind of hesitant about making uh, Gegard Mousasi up against Rory McDonald. Obviously, you're against it, you know, for, for a couple of reasons. What would you like to see your brother do next? Who would you like to see him fight, if not Rory, for the belt, obviously? Man, he's waiting, man. He's waiting. He, 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 needs to, he wants to fight, man. He's been training hard, you know. He wants to fight, man. You know, they said this week we'll know something. So, you know, we'll know something. Hopefully, by the end of this week, you know, they'll announce what they're going to do. And, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you. Oh, we got Diego cutting out here a little bit. Hopefully we'll get him back. That's all we know for now. They won't tell him. They won't tell him anything. And, you know, we're just waiting. So you actually just cut out right when you said that last sentence. Can you just repeat that last sentence? What did they say to your brother? Oh, yeah, I said we're just waiting right now. You know, the only thing we know is what we saw, in, uh, you know, online, you know, with the Mosashi and, and McDonald. And other than that, man, we don't know anything. They, we should know something this week about what they're going to do with him, but... Right now, we're just playing a waiting game and training. So, what's next with you? What, what do you think your next move is here? Obviously, your your last fight was, you know, a couple of months ago here. What are you going to be doing, uh, you know, come the next Man, few months? I'm just waiting now. You know, I, I've asked for a fight already. You know, I asked for August or September. You know, it took, I was out for eight weeks, man. Like, because of my ribs, I was out for eight weeks. I couldn't do anything. No type of training. So, you know, it's been I've, the past four weeks. It's just me getting back in shape, and you know, now I'm in shape, and I'm just ready to hit camp. You know, whenever they give me a day, you know, I'll start camp, and boom, here we go. So just waiting. So moving forward, man. Honestly, you know, you had um, I, I was looking at some of your uh, past fights, man. And it seems like you're doing a lot of reminiscing on, you know, your first or second fight. If there's any advice at all that you can give, you know, maybe an amateur champion over at Cage Titans or, or, or Titan FC or whatever, what would be, you know, a good piece of advice for an amateur looking to make their pro debut? Man, just be patient, you know. Be patient. The time will come. The thing with amateurs, they want to rush everything, you know. They see a fight, they see somebody doing good, they're like, I want that fight, you know, I'm like, I can beat them, I can beat them, but, you know, the thing is, they got to be patient, man, be patient, you know, get as many fights as you can, you know, if you're healthy, you fight, and the biggest thing, man, if you have any type of injury going in, like if it's, if it's anything serious, man, pull out of the fight, you know, don't, don't try to be a hero and fight injured, you know, don't do that, I've made that mistake again, and I should have learned from it, and I did it again, and, you know, that's one thing that hurts so much after, you know, because you know you can do so much better, but your body won't allow you, you know. So just if you hurt, you know, just pull out of a fight. There's no reason to act tough. And, you know, nobody pays your bills, you know. At the end of the day, those people that are talking crap, oh, he's pulling out, whatever, you know, they're not going to pay your bills. So just make sure you listen to your body and, you know, be patient. So we actually have a question in the chat room. I got two two questions for you really quick. 
One being from the chat room, we kind of brushed on this, but I want to make it fair for the people tuning in. So Harvey Weinstein asks, um, you know, after losing to Jesse and hearing Jesse was popped by USADA, do you feel robbed of that 250K? No, man, I don't, man. I don't. If you asked me that week, like when I found out of that, now, of course I was. Man. That that week, you know, I was like, what? No, man. But then, you know, as I sat down, man, I know how much the dude works, man. He worked hard for that. He trains very hard, and he beat me, man. He just beat me. No, I don't feel robbed at all. So my next question for you, my last question before we let you go here, because I know you got a busy day, Diego. So, you know, you're on two seasons so far of The Ultimate Fighter. And now come the end of 2018, we're actually going to see the last, you know, the last, uh, what we might see of the last uh, episode of The Ultimate Fighter with season 28 and the big change over to ESPN. So now we have Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series. How do you feel about, uh, you know, the Contender Series? Do you think this is a, a good idea for them? Do you think... Ultimate Fighter may make a return somewhere down the road. What are your thoughts? Man, I'm not sure, man. I think, you know, the Ultimate Fighter, you know, there's not, you go around, man, there's not a lot of people watching anymore, you know? Like, they, over here, you know, for my season, you know, around me, you know, every, everyone watched it because I live here, you know, like, say, in Atlanta. But then you go to all the other seasons, man, even at my gym, man, like, my members and stuff, I go talk to them, hey, did you see that episode last week? They're like, huh? trying to get everybody's pros pick on an upcoming fight that is coming up for week seven or week six or or weeks i think week six of dana white's season a contender series we have notorious nick newell um in case anybody doesn't know he's from west haven connecticut about 10 minutes down the road from us here at pure evil on the may he's known for having one arm he's only lost one fight and that was against justin gaethje oh, yeah. how do you think he's gonna do on the contender series and you know soon oh, to be in the man, ufc he's gonna do great man he's gonna do great like i i think we fought on the same card before i believe if he wasn't a, yeah i think we fought on the same card before and i've always been you know i've always known him i've always talked to him so i've been following his whole career man from the beginning we fought in the xfc before you know and you know i know the guy man he's tough man like he used to train at coconut creek and you know i've had some training partners that trained with him before man man this is a real deal man like he it, it, <laughs> he's the real deal, man. I know how tough he is. He's great on the ground. Like, he's tough as he can be. He hits hard. And, you know, he's a normal fighter, man. He's going to do great. Last but not least, are you a little sad that the Ultimate Fighter is coming to a close? How, how do you how do you feel about that? Man, it sucks. You know, that's like, man, that's a, a huge, huge part of my career, man. Like, I'm 6-0 and on that show, you know, it's got me two UFC contracts, and, you know, that show, man, it's pretty much my life, man, I love that show, and, you know, just to see it go away, man, it sucks, man, it really does, it, it, that's gonna be, that, uh, that sucks. Diego, I want to thank you so much for joining me here today on Pure Evil MMA once again. We want to wish you best of luck, best of skill, and your future journey here in the MMA scene. And last but not least, if you have any shout-outs, any sponsors, anything at all that you want to get out on the table, the floor is all yours. Man, thank you very much, man. I appreciate you having me again. Just want to thank my sponsors, you know, Plant Blade, Shirts, and uh, Talented Reflex, man. Just make sure you keep those those guys out. You know, I'm always posting stuff about them and, you know, follow them, help us out on social media. And, you know, I'm shooting to hear something about my fight soon. And as soon as, uh, as, soon as I have anything, I'll let you guys know. And, you know, I'll see you soon, man. Definitely keep us posted. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day. There you go, guys. Diego Lima, UFC veteran, ultimate fighter. Very cool to see his take, you know, now that we, you know, we're at the end of the Ultimate Fighter. I mean, 28 seasons we're going to be ending up. That's almost 30 seasons. You're doing uh, two seasons a year. Dan White Tuesday Night Contender Series, I've been asking a lot of fighters, and it doesn't seem like any of them really 
are that upset. But when you have somebody like Diego, who's been on two seasons, who's six and zero on on the Ultimate Fighter, you know it's a little sad because I do enjoy going back, watching some of these old seasons. You know, the Redemption season that was a lot of fun for a lot of the people that were tuning in towards the you know early years of Ultimate Fighter, like myself or you know Ted Shack or or you guys. So, what do you guys feel about the Ultimate Fighter leaving and the new era of the Anyway Susan A Contender Series? Let me know on Twitter, Evil Under Dash Echo, and on Instagram at Pure Evil MMA. Guys, the Anyway Susan A Contender Series Week Three going down this week with Antonina Shevchenko. So, before I let you guys go, I promise I would give you my take and just let you guys know I will be giving a better rundown on this and. A release of the new show and before we jump into that make sure you guys subscribe down below for weekly interviews and on itunes podbean stitcher podomatic you can find all the pure evil mma content at mymmanews.com you can see that on both sides here um guys so this week is a big week for the shevchenko sisters now i've watched antonina shevchenko throughout her muay thai career in the past couple of years she came into lion fight and i'll never forget her first fight for lion fight she came in her opponent didn't make weight everyone was upset Lion Fight gave her the belt. She comes back and actually defends it. Did very well in that fight. Even knocked her opponent out of the freaking ring. It was it was a violent fight. Antonita looked absolutely amazing. But let me say this. I've seen her fight, I think, three or three times now, live, in person. I've got to talk with her before and after the fights or whatnot. Amazing team. We all know that she comes from um, obviously a great team and her sister training with some of the best in the world like Rose Namajunas and what have you but and I, I say this with the most respect and you can look at this two ways so Antonina Shevchenko in her last fight went down about 8 weeks ago give or take it was at Lion Fight 42 at Foxwoods Casino 41-42 I believe uh, Lion Fight 42 so she had an amazing fight, don't get me wrong. But here's the thing. The fight went to a decision. If she had that same performance on Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series this week, spot on, same performance. And you gotta remember, it is Muay Thai, it's not MMA. I do not think it would be enough for her to get the contract. But before you throw stones, before you click exit, and get mad at me here, or comment some stuff, let me say this. Maybe she was playing it safe because we found out that she was gonna be on the Contender Series a couple of weeks before she was on Lion Fight. Now, she also was on the MMA Hour. You had all these people weighing in. Her profile on Instagram and Twitter went skyrocketing after that moment. This is a big deal for her. So, there's a piece of me that feels like she wanted to play it safe. Her and her team wanted to play it safe because you have to, you have to feel if she lost in this fight, even a decision loss and loses the belt, Fans are going to feel some type of way. She's going to go in with more pressure on her back. She was going in with a lot of pressure on her back. And I, I've even talked to them about this. And uh, Valentina even said, said to me, she was like, I get more nervous when my sister fights than when I fight. And, you know, Valentina, man, she was so awesome in the corner. If you guys watched my Instagram story that night, and you guys can go back. I have it highlighted on my Instagram. Valentina was making sure her sister had, had all the right corner advice, had all the right every ounce of sweat dropped off. She even, she even was waving her down with her towel. I, had, I was right there. I was no less than four feet away from as, as she was doing that. And when we found out that she won, Valentina runs into the crowd, grabs the flag, and drapes it over her sister. And it was just such an amazing feeling. And I'm very excited to see what happens this week on Dana Wade Tuesday Night Contender Series. I'm extremely nervous. I try not to be biased. Her opponent is a very tough girl. Me and Nolan actually kind of got into that discussion. You guys can check that out on our Dana Wade Tuesday Night Contender Series preview, which is down here in the playlist below for you guys and on iTunes and Podbean. But like I said, if she goes into this week and had that same performance, I do not think it would be enough for her to get the contract, especially considering last week's week two Dana White Susan Night Contender Series, they gave away four contracts, which is a lot. So you, you have to think that somebody probably said something to Dana White afterwards, like, you know, we can't just be handing these things out, man. I mean, it was a great week. Week one was a great week as well. Week two picked up even more momentum. Week three, there's a lot of hype behind it. You have Antonina Shevchenko going in there trying to make her dreams come true. This is huge. This entire season, we have a lot of great fighters coming on. I was just asking Diego about Nick Newell. 
Nick Newell is about 10 minutes away from me right now, training down the road with Justin Sung. These two guys, you got Nick on week six, you got Justin on week seven. Just think about the energy inside that gym, the excitement. I am so blessed. And I was just talking with Nolan about this last night. I feel so blessed to be living and witnessing these moments in MMA right now. It reminds me, and I go back to when I was a kid and I dreamed of this. I'm, that's why I say I'm so blessed. Behind me here, let me raise the camera for you guys here a little bit in the studio. I was talking about this last week. And this picture is behind me for a reason here. Right here, we got Roger Maris. You got Mickey Mantle here. 1961. If you guys don't know the story about that, well, I'm from New York. I'm Italian. Trust me, my grandparents told me that story when it was time to go to bed. Now, just hearing the stories of back in the day, what the baseball scene was like in those years, 1961, the late 50s, the New York Yankees coming off, you know, Babe Ruth and Joe DiMaggio and all these big stars. Then you have Roger Maris coming in to break records. Fans didn't like Roger Maris to come in and touch Babe Ruth's record. Mickey Mantle and him were chasing that home run record the entire year until Mickey Mantle unfortunately had to pull out of that home run drive. And we all know the story. Roger Maris breaks or ties Babe Ruth's 61 record. There was a lot of controversy because, you know, there were more there were more games or, or more days in the season or whatever. But just the fact of how special that moment in time was really reflects on where you are right now in mixed martial arts. You have a couple of guys out there like, Conor McGregor, you got Ronda Rousey, who obviously is retired, but her name has helped grow the sport in the last few years. You got all these nice up-and-comers making a name for themselves. You got Robert Whitaker, you got Rose Namajunas. You got all these big stars making a rise. And I, I love trying to make sense of it all with you guys. I feel so blessed to witness this. And Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series is going to play a huge role and expanding the MMA scene and getting people excited to go check out more local events. Hey, I saw the guy in Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series. I think he can be in the UFC soon. Now, here's one thing about the Contender Series that I'm a little iffy about. If we remember week one with Hardy, you know, a guy who's not very experienced in MMA, but you want to sign him. I mean, he gets an amazing knockout, but he's not ready yet for the UFC. What do you do with somebody like that? I mean, you have all these guys coming from LFA or Titan FC. So, for, you know, for you to say, well, sign them, put them in a feeder league. They're already coming from feeder leagues. Now there's all this news that Greg Hardy's back playing arena football. There's all this controversy going on about it. Man, what do you do? You know, this would be a good platform for, for Bellator, honestly, when you got these younger fighters. But, you know, UFC is investing their time and money, obviously, now into some of these young guns. But it's, it's, it's scary because they're so inexperienced. And I really don't want to see another 0-1-1 versus an 0-1-1 guy on a pay-per-view card ever again. I think a lot of you guys would agree with me on that. But I'll tell you this. I'm very excited about these next couple of weeks for Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series. Also, if you guys want to find out more information, like I said, me and Nolan broke all that down for you guys. You can find that on the playlist down below or at MyMMANews.com. I want to thank you guys so much for joining me here today on Pure Evil MMA. What a weekend it was. I mean, Cowboy Cerrone, let comment on that really quick before I let you guys go. You know, I talked about this on, on Instagram Live. Make sure you guys are following me there at Pure Evil MMA. But here's the thing. Cowboy Cerrone, if we look at his career, he's never consecutively lost fights. He always, you know, goes on a couple fight win streak, then he'll lose a fight, but then he gets back on the horse. And then he just starts slaying dudes. I mean, he took out everyone in the division. He changes divisions. Now we're hoping we don't see a depleted Cowboy. But, you know, in the last year, the last two years, you know, Cowboy's been losing the guys that he should be beating, in my opinion. No, I'm not taking anything away from Leon Edwards. I'm not taking anything away from Darren Till. Darren Till even proven himself against, you know, Wonder Boy most recently. At the same time, Cowboy Cerrone, him, you know, he fights a lot. And you got to take that into consideration. A lot of these fighters you see fight once, maybe twice a year. Cowboy Cerrone fought four times in 2016, four times in 2015. 
I mean, the guy's just, he, he's a fighter. He's a fighter's fighter. He's the guy, even if he's losing, he's fighting elite fighters. But now we're seeing him kind of fall down, uh, you know, the top 10 when he should be beating guys in the top five. And the big whack on Cowboy for years was, all right, he, he wins all these fights against non-title fights. But once you give him that big shot, you know, like RDA, he loses. But you know what? Cowboy Cerrone, man, it just wouldn't be the same without him, I feel. He's such a staple in the UFC. He brings so much excitement. He's another one of these guys like a Justin Gaethje where you don't really care if he wins or loses. You know that he's going to go in there and he's going to put on a fight. But then again, I'm, I'm kind of contradicting myself because here's the, another thing about Cowboy that I always worry about. And if you're somebody that puts money on these fights, you might also worry about the same thing. You don't know what Cowboy is going to be showing up come fight night. Now, Cowboy also said after the fight, in case you guys didn't catch it, that he wasn't feeling that well um, the week of the fight. He was even thinking about pulling out. And we just heard Diego moments ago say to, you know, amateurs or guys, you know, trying to come pro, you would think that, you know, somebody at this level would know to pull out. But, you know, even Diego said, if there's something wrong, you don't feel right about the fight, you're taking it on short notice or what have you, something's not feeling right, trust your gut reaction. These aren't Diego's exact words, but pretty much in a nutshell. Don't risk it, man. This is your pro career. Every fight counts so heavily. In this sport, you're best known for your last fight or your last two fights. I mean, Cowboy Cerrone has had an amazing career. But what weighs most is how you've done in the last year or two. And if you look at Cowboy Cerrone in his last year or two, I mean, I mean, oh, damn. I mean, that fight with, with Robbie Lawler, that was a close fight. A lot of people even think that Cowboy won that fight. I personally scored it for Robbie Lawler. But Robbie Lawler, you can also have the same argument with him. It's very tough because the way I also look at it is, this is the UFC. You guys can argue with me if you want, but you're fighting against the best in the world. Like I said, you can argue with me if you want about them. But nonetheless, the Ultimate Fighting Championship has gathered up the elite in the MMA scene. And when you're fighting guys like RDA, Young up-and-comers like Darren Till, guys like RDA, uh, Robbie Lawler, sorry for repeating myself, uh, Rick Story. These are tough opponents. You know, how would how would Cowboy Story do over in Bellator? Well, look at Gegard Mousasi. Look at Rory McDonald, who just fought Diego's brother. Not having the easiest of times. They're having to bite down on their mouth guard and really give it all, which what you should do in MMA. But I feel like a lot of people feel that well, I'll have an easier ride if I go to Bellator. And we're learning that's not the case. Big John McCarthy even coming out and said it this week. It's just not the case. I interviewed Justin Gaethje going on three, maybe four years ago when he was fighting for World Series of Fighting. Now, I talked to him backstage at this event and I asked him. You guys can find this interview down below here on the YouTube channel. I said, Justin, you have all these promotions talking about you. This is before he's in the UFC, obviously. You have all these promotions talking about you, man. What are you thinking? Do you think you want to go to Bellator? Do you want to go to UFC? I mean, there's a lot of fighters that are leaving the UFC to go to Bellator. What's your take on it? You know what Justin Gaethje told me? Word for word, maybe not word for word. He said, not all of the best fighters are in the UFC. I had so many people comment and say that he's crazy. Man, he's proved his point coming over. And I think now when you're seeing guys like uh, Benson Henderson go over to Bellator. You're seeing guys like uh, Gegard Mousasi. You're seeing guys, you know, along the along that line. And they're not having these easy fights. And I think that now that we're in 2018, moving towards 2020, Bellator coming towards the rise. They do have a couple of things they need to fix. But you know, with the Bellator Grand Prix, they're signing guys from UFC. They have you guys over from the UFC one go to Bellator. But then you got guys like Michael Chandler, who I feel should come to the UFC. But I feel like Bellator is definitely making that climb. And if Cowboy Cerrone were to go over Bellator, I don't think it would be any easier for him. I don't know what it is that he needs to change. I don't think he should retire. You'll never hear me say a fighter should retire. But Cowboy also noted, he said, I'm not going to stop until the UFC tells me, man, you've had enough. And one thing that worries me to, to close this out 
Because when you have a guy like Cowboy Cerrone that's fighting as much as he does, like I said, fighting four times a year, that's a lot. Fighters don't fight that much. And just the simple fact that this guy, as much as he fights and the big names that he fights, isn't extremely wealthy at this moment in his career, or now you have people talking about possibly the end of his career, and he might not be comfortable enough to even retire with, you know, enough money, it worries me. The sport should not be there. And it brings me back to, you know, the, the Mickey Mantle era, 1961. You know, the fighters need to come together. You know, the media guys like myself, like Nolan, like James, like Kobe, like the Chris, who, who, whoever. We can only say so much. We can only raise so much awareness. We can only get so many reactions. It's up to the fighters. And I love what Leslie Smith is doing. I'm not saying that's the exact route that people should go. But within the next few years, this this has to be figured out. It's just so sad to see guys like Cowboy and the careers that they've had. People like Showtime Pettis, the career that he's had, not be able to retire comfortably. And you look at these sports like the NFL, NHL, all these guys making big money. And you see UFC 225, you know, rumor to come in with 150K buys. What's going on? How do we fix this? I'll leave you off with this. I do think in the next year, next two years, three years, especially with the big ESPN deal that has now come to light and brought onto the table, me and James McSweeney, we are just talking about this last Monday on our new podcast, which you guys must subscribe to. Um, James McSweeney versus Evil Eddie. I guess that's the name of the podcast right now. We're going to be releasing the actual name of the podcast come uh, next Monday. We're releasing the podcast bi-weekly, but me and James are talking about this exact thing. What were we talking about here? Why am I drawing a blank now? Oh yeah, ESPN. Me and James talking about the same thing. With ESPN coming over and signing UFC, we all know UFC likes to have somewhat control over what the analysis are saying. We saw Errol Hawani lose his job uh, for, for reasons about, you know, talking about other organizations or, or whatever. You know, ESPN shows highlights of Shamrock FC. They show highlights of of Belter, whatever. You'll see, you know, you don't see that on FS1. I'm showing clips of Bellator. ESPN is also very political. Me and Ted Check were talking about it. And James made the note, it's going to be better for the UFC. It's going to be better for the fighters. You know, you're going to have a better platform, a bigger platform for their analysis. Their guys like, you know, Colin Coward or, or whatever. And I'm not, Colin's been doing it for a while, talking with Dana or what, whatever. My point being that it's a bigger platform for the fighters to have a voice, for more outsiders to to watch and, and come into more people's homes. And people will have an opinion on it more. It will help the sport. 100% it will help the sport. And it, it, it's kind of weird because you would think Dana would kind of be against that. Like I said, they like to have somewhat control over the narrative of a lot of these, uh, you know, upcoming fights or, you know, people like Hardy who are, you know, very controversial fighters. You know, there's there's a lot of cases we could put out there. My point being is that ESPN not afraid to talk about any of that stuff. And that in itself will definitely help the sport move forward. You know, originally going back, Ultimate Fighter being on Spike, USA, whatever it was at the time. Then getting the transfer over to FS1. Now ESPN. You can only see the rise. And I did say UFC 225 had very low numbers. But you also have to remember. There's also a lot more cards. That have been coming on in the last few years as well. So with that last note guys. I want to thank you so much. For tuning in this episode of Pure Evil MMA. Episode 120. Can you believe that? Episode 120. With Diego Lima. We got to hear about Diego's take on. You know, Jesse, you got to hear Diego's take on the Ultimate Fighter coming to a close. Dana White's Susan A. Contender Series. His take on his brother. And he even said that Roy McDonald probably will never want to fight his brother ever again. What do you guys think about that? And what's next? Do you think that Roy McDonald will, if he does, you know, win in this fight against Gegard Mousasi? Would he ever go in a rematch with, with Lima? You know, Douglas Lima definitely proved that he's a tough son of a bee. Anyone that doubted him before, anyone who didn't know him before, 
knows who he is now. And you know what? There's a picture on on Diego's Instagram that I love of him and Rory. And Rory, man, this guy's been through so many, so many crazy fights. Or just like, you know, I could never imagine watching somebody I care about go through what Rory McDonald's gone through. You know, I see it firsthand on Press Row, like last week at CES 50. You know, he, on Press Row, you're seeing the family members, uh, you know, walk up to the gate right next to the cage to watch you know, their little brother, their their boyfriend, whatever, their girlfriend fight. And it's it's so hard to watch, you know, somebody you love get TKO'd and watching the react. It's hard to even watch the reaction of the reaction. It's a very tough sport. And to watch what Rory McDonald's gone through in the past couple of years, Man, you know, how, how many more fights can he go through with that? And the same same with Cowboy Cerrone. How many more fights can these guys go through? Until, you know, enough's really enough where it catches up with you. What's next for Diego Lima? Let me know what you guys think. Did you enjoy this interview, guys? Let me know on the iTunes page because that is the most important uh, place to be weighing in. If you guys give us a review, it will help reach more MMA fans out there that are listening to similar shows like the MMA Hour, Luke Thomas' show. Well, Luke is now the MMA hour, which is also a weird thing that we didn't talk about. What do you guys think about that? You know, I'm trying to close the show up with a quick thought on that. Very weird. You know, I don't know what to really feel about Ariel Hawani and uh, Chael Sonnen doing the show. You know, Ariel's saying that nothing's going to change, but there's there's changes here. You know, I think a lot of fans are, are sad that, you know, the MMA hour is gone. Maybe some are glad. You know, I, I've seen a lot of mixed reviews about Luke Thomas taking that role, which is kind of weird because now I feel like you know, I enjoy listening to Luke, I enjoy listening to MMA Hour, and I mix them in, you know, throughout the week during my workouts or, or morning commute, whatever. And now I feel like, you know, the playlist is cut down. You know, I, I'm subscribed to MMA Hour, I'm subscribed to Luke Thomas' show, now that's blending into one. So it's almost feeling like I lost a, uh, lost a good show there. But who knows? I, you know, I don't know what to expect because I haven't seen the product yet. So we, we still have to wait and see, uh, see what happens here but nonetheless guys congratulations to Errol Hawani moving to ESPN whether you love him or hate him he's done so much for the sport he's one of the most recognized journalists we have in the sport and for him to be moving up to ESPN it's the right guy you know let me tell you this really quick before I go uh, when I was at the last Bellator event that I covered uh, Matt Mitchell versus Roy Nelson I sat next to one of the ESPN journalists and I won't throw a name under the bus but somebody that's pretty known over at ESPN, they were sitting there next to me covering, you know, Bellator, and the whole time, they were bashing MMA, they are bashing Bellator, they are bashing the fights, you know, it was very hard for us to get a good Wi-Fi connection, guy started complaining, I'm from ESPN, uh, I'm not like one of these other, you know, low-life MMA websites, it, it was just very disrespectful, it made me feel some type of way about it. You know, I feel like there's a lot of people out there that do exactly what I do that are more worthy of, of holding a title at ASPN that would do it justice and to show love towards the sport and educate fans that aren't so familiar with Bellator. You know, to sit there and bash our sport, it made me so mad. It made me mad. You know, I hope that, you know, ESPN moving forward, having somebody like Errol and Chael will now educate more fans Get them excited about the sport. This is the best sport on the planet, in my opinion. This is not a very big planet, mind you. You know, people think this, this planet's a million miles round. It's about 23,000 miles round. Very small. The sports on this planet, you got MLB, you got football. Well, that's localized in the United States. Then you got soccer, kind of global. MMA is a world-renowned sport. Global. Brazil. America. Canada. China, everywhere, Thailand, you're uniting all these different cultures, you're educating not just on the sport, but on other cultures as well, and realizing that, you know, somebody that on the other side of the planet is just like me, they're no different, different cultures, different races, they're just like me, they can take a punch just like me, they deal with a loss just like me, and I think that's very very humbling, very, I, I like that, there's there's something about that that I really like in this sport, and people look at this sport like, you know, it's a violent gladiator, Sparta, and, you know, you, 
Yeah, the sport's been around for ages, years. This sport, you know, the reason why we're at the edge of our seat when we watch the sport is because it's in our blood. You know, we've been watching gladiators for years. And it's just crazy that it's not the biggest sport on the planet, but it's it's going to be there in the next five, ten years. Mark my words. If it's not, I'll be really surprised. But all in all, this is the best life sport on the planet. There's nothing like when you go to a baseball game, when you go to a football game, you're not at the edge of your seat on the first kickoff or the first throw. You're not at the edge of your seat on the first pitch. I'm at the edge of my seat as soon as I hear those two gloves tap. It's on. Anything can happen. And it's not like you have a team that you can root on. It's every 15 minutes, there's someone new to root for. Not three hours of, you know, it's tiresome watching other sports. You know, I played high school football. I was the captain of, on the freshman football team. Uh, played baseball my entire life on the all-star team. I was obsessed with all these sports. I don't pay any attention to them anymore. None. I got my ear to the track in MMA and it's as it's all I need to feel fulfilled and get me excited up wake up excited in the morning to know what's gonna be next what fights are gonna uh, come what fighters are gonna blossom this year who should we look forward to hey, I love it it's so exciting and it brings me back to you know the leather helmet era like I'm talking about with baseball in the early years I hope you guys understand what I'm saying and I hope you guys enjoyed episode 120 of Pure Evil MMA with Diego Lima. Guys, have a great day. Wait knuckles till the end. Subscribe down below. And last but not least, behave yourselves.